today we've heard a little bit about nanowires, and we've heard, uh, we will hear a lot more about later today why they are so great for things like electronics, light emitting diodes, biomedicine, we already uh, heard something about, uh, thermoelectrics, basic physics studies, and my favorite subject, solar cells. But one nanowire is usually not enough, so you need to pack them together to make something useful of them. And if you pack a lot of nanowires together, this is how many you would fit on, for example, a red blood cell. Um, if you pack them densely together, there are about 10,000 of them uh, on this blood cell. And if you then take this blood cell and put a lot of those onto the end of a hair, you get uh, fit about 100 blood cells on that hair. So now we have about a million nanowires if we pack them, pack them densely together. And to make something like solar cells on a big scale, we need a lot of those nanowires, obviously. So how do we make a lot of nanowires? There, um, we need to mass produce them. So typically, usually nanowires are grown by MOVPE, metal organic vapor phase epitaxy. And that's a process that takes place in a crystal growth machine. Uh, it's a batch process. You load your wafer, uh, you will hear more about how nanowires grow uh, later today, um, the details of that. You load your wafer, heat it up, add chemical precursors, grow the nanowires, let it cool down, take it out, uh, and that's a cycle time of at least 30 minutes. If you do it really well, you might be able to do it in 30 minutes. Today it's typically two hours cycle time. So, and the largest machines today, they can handle maybe a handful of wafers 30 centimeters wide, uh, large. We don't have any of those machines at our lab. We, we grow maximum this size wafers. Um, so currently, uh, that's really not an alternative to, for large surfaces. Another problem with traditionally grown nanowires is that they grow rather slowly, on the order of 1 to 10 nanometers per second. And that's about the same rate as a child grows from conception to adulthood. It's sort of the average, average rate of growth is about three nanometers per second, if you, if you calculate that. So that's rather slow. Um, so what we uh, do instead is to grow our nanowires in the aerosol phase, free-flying aerosol, uh, aerosol wires. Um, and the reason for doing this, first of all, there's a fundamental science reason for doing this, and that's to test, test some of the fundamentals of nanowire growth. So, um, in a crystal, you have various directions that uh, you can define. Uh, one, uh, one, uh, uh, and one of them is called the one, one, one direction, and that is typically the one where nanowires grow. We know this because um, no, re almost regardless of what kind of substrate you grow the wires on, they will tend to grow in the 111 direction. So the question is, if you could take nanowires and uh, hold them in tweezers, is there an intrinsic reason for them to grow in this 111 direction? So if you could just hold the uh, seed particle in a tweezer, in a pair of tweezers, and then let it grow, where, uh, what crystal direction would it have? So that's the, one of the fundamental science reasons for grow, doing this in the aerosol phase, because flying around freely is the closest we can get to actually holding them in a tweezer currently. Another reason for, um, the, uh, for gro going to an aerosol is that this is a continuous process. We blow an aerosol through the growth machine uh, at a steady rate, and a continuous process is much easier to optimize than a, uh, than a batch process. For, you can think of a paper mill, for example, just feeding material through, and uh, you, can, you can more easily optimize it, for, for example, for materials use. Um, another reason is that the, since they're free-flying, there is no crystalline substrate to, to take uh, into account, so we don't need to worry about how to, how to match the growth of the nanowires to the crystalline substrate. And on that note, uh, to deposit them, we can deposit them on anything 
uh, we just make the wires and then we can put them down on basically anything or into a liquid. So the growth of nanowires works like this. We produce gold particles. Uh, we size select those gold, gold particles. I could give a lecture on that uh, separately. We then add precursors and then in a tube furnace the wires grow at a rate of about one micrometer per second. So at this rate your child would be fully grown in 36 hours. So that's of course a great advantage for, uh, for the production rate of nanowire material. And then we collect uh, the nanowires. So we have two versions of this um, uh, that I will talk about. First, I'll tell you about the single aerotaxi reactor. That is a single vertical reactor where you have full control of flows going in and out. Uh, you have, uh, this is situated inside a three zone furnace, the, the one that we have in the lab currently for a good temperature control of the growth zone. And in this case, the growth time can be up to six seconds. So that means that we could grow roughly about six, six micron, mi up to about six micron wires. And the goals of this uh, machine is to investigate uh, and get high material quality, uh, large amounts of nanowires uh, to get a good control of the nanowire size in both terms of diameter and the length, and to exper experiment with doping of nanowires. So some results from this, you can see that uh, I won't show you the, the graphs, you can just imagine that uh, if you use your eyes, you can see that they're pretty much the same length and size. Um, here, we, we do have some statistics. In the best cases, we get down to a, a standard deviation of about 10% plus or minus uh, in the length uh, variation. Um, and if we just continue to collect the wires, we collect more and more of them, and eventually we just end up with a whole, whole pile of uh, of nanowires. Currently, our uh, collaboration company, Solvoltaics, is working on a way to get these nanowires into a liquid directly from the gas phase into a liquid. So the results on doping that we have so far is that we've doped these nanowires with zinc uh, to get them uh, conducting, uh, P-type conducting. And uh, we can, we've shown this by photoluminescence and by uh, by, uh, by X-ray fluorescence in the TEM. And what we see here is that we can track the uh, zinc content from the gold particle and down into the wire, and we can see that we do have uh, zinc incorporated into the nanowires. And the photoluminescence signal shows us that the doping is on the order of 10 to the 20 or lower. So that's quite quite high doping that we can get, still without ruining the nanowire growth, which it, uh, at these doping levels, MOVPE-grown wires typically don't grow as nicely as our wires do. So we then go to multiple growth zones. We take our single uh, aerotaxi reactor. Now this is called the generation three and a half. Uh, that's the newest one that we have working so far. And we stack them together uh, vertically. And then we can, uh, so this is a modular system, you can stack these aerotaxi reactors on top of each other, inject different precursors at each stage, and the goal of this is to grow nanowires with PN junctions, or little diodes. And now we're starting to get to the solar cell, because a solar cell is just a diode, and if we can make a lot of nanowire diodes, stack them together, and we can make a large solar cell. Um, or at least we can we can try to make that. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's uh, the, the goal of this. And um, other goals of this multiple zone is to make a highly doped contact region, to make a shell growth for passivation, and so on. And if you want to know exactly how this works on a microscopic scale, you should look at this. Here we see that the gold, uh, uh, the gold particle is exposed to P-doped gallium arsenide growth, and then you, in this next reactor, it's N-doped gallium arsenide, and you get your PN wire. It's not quite as simple as that. So, some examples of the first aerotaxi-grown PN wires. First up here, you see uh, the, 
um, photoluminescence signal from the black curve is uh, MOVPE grown, intrinsic, n-doped, intrinsic and n-doped wires. Uh, and the red curve is uh, a low doping and the blue curve is a high doping from aerotaxy. And what you see here is that the photoluminescence signal is a, uh, about the same, room temperature photoluminescence is about the same as for MOVPE grown wires. And um, in using infrared scanning near field optical microscopy or IR SNOM, you can visualize uh, the doping uh, of the nanowires by the phase shift of the uh, infrared signal. Right now, don't ask me that question, <laughs> because that's the, uh, that's the only one I don't want after this talk, exactly how this works. But in the, anyway, you can see uh, in the uh, bottom wire, that's the high doped uh, uh, wire where the luminescence tells us that it's three, three times 10 to the 19. You can see a pretty clear white region close to the gold particle. And in the other one, uh, you see um, a lighter region close to the gold particle. So that's undoped plus n-doped uh, wires in the aerotaxi. So that's those, these are the first results from this. So, what are we doing now? Um, we are building, to, or Solvoltaics is building the generation 4 aerotaxi reactor. It's in a lab in Lund, uh, up outside, just next to Ideon. Um, this is for pre-pilot production. Uh, this can do up to six growth stages. You see the, um, the high tower here. Inside here is the aerotaxi reactor. And this is actually on schedule to be first started today. Sometime today will be the first gases turned on, uh, gold particles created, and um, we'd, we'll see when we get the first wires out of this. Um, so this is already being scaled up uh, as, an, as an industry that uh, Magnus is chairman of, that he talked about in the beginning. So, thank you, and uh, any questions? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, beautiful work on, on the nanowires. Um, you, you said um, you just have to assemble them. Yeah. If I envision that, <laughs> that slide with the whole fields of solar cells, mm -hmm. um, still, do you have any ideas how, how to bring them from that pile that you showed in the SEM, um, that mess, um, to highly arranged structure? The, the short answer is yes. Uh, but <laughs> that is something that the, that our, that the company Solvo takes is working on completely internally without any collaboration. Uh, I know some of what they're doing, um, but I really don't know enough to tell you even if I was allowed to. Um, but um, um, so Magnus is giving me the... <laughs> So, so yes, there is a really big group at Solvoltaics, and what I can tell you is that if this was a university project, there would be a lot of really good publications coming from that. But it, there is not not that yet. So I can say that um, what Martin talked about, it is a big challenge, and the question is one of the big uh, uh, concerns I had with the project from the beginning. But I, I'm actually quite pleased with the progress the team has made, and we do see a lot of interesting. Re uh, results, which gives us uh, quite a great confidence that this problem will be solved. This is a great example of really where it should be, from science to business, as you said. So, thank you very much.